In this section, we're going to talk about service configuration, and we'll talk about secrets, which are typically part of service configuration. Um, and this includes reconfiguration, too. You may already have a service that's running, and then you just want to change some state, maybe connection strings, or something about that service. So it's reconfiguring it um, while it's in production. So we use configuration for information that shouldn't be stored in the source code. Uh, things that qualify for this are things like account names, uh, secrets, passwords, certificates, uh, database connection strings, etc. Now for secrets, like passwords, you want to use a thing called cryptographic message syntax, or CMS, in order to avoid putting clear text secrets in your configuration. I'm going to talk more about CMS on the very next slide. So we'll talk about that in more detail soon. For a 12-factor service application, uh, it is recommended that you pass your configuration to your service by way of environment variables. Um, that's because, again, we talked about this earlier, environment variables is a standard. Every operating system supports it. It's a very simple and easy mechanism that is just pervasive and easy to work with. It's also easy to work with in a development environment while you're doing testing to change some of these uh, values as environment variables and then rerun the service to see how it behaves. So there's just a lot of benefits to the simplicity of this. When you want to go and change the configuration, though, this means you are changing environment variables. So the first thing you will need to do is you'll need to stop the process. And we just talked about how to gracefully shut down a process using that integer that you atomically increment and decrement until it gets to zero. So you would tell your process you want it to stop. It would run through the graceful shutdown that I just talked about. Then you would go and reconfigure the environment variables and then restart the process using those new environment variables and now it's up and running. So it's kind of like doing an upgrade, but we're not upgrading the code. Instead, we're upgrading the configuration that the code will be using. But it's very similar other than that aspect of it. When using a rolling upgrade to reconfigure, you might have to roll back. In case during the rolling upgrade, version 2 is experiencing some problems, you might want to roll back. Um, and this may happen if you're doing a rolling upgrade to roll out new configuration as well. Uh, you might bring down a, you know, whatever version happens to be running just to change environment variables and then bring up the same version of code yet again, but now it is reconfigured. It's possible that the new settings will cause the service to stop running properly again. So if you do a rollback, make sure that the rollback includes any of the previous configuration state because you're not really changing the version of the code. You're really just changing the configuration state. So it's important to keep that in mind. At the bottom of the slide here, I want to talk about a thing that I've noticed that certain orchestrators do. And it's a thing that I've grown to, I think, is really a bad pattern. Um, I've personally run into problems with this, and I've worked with a lot of other customers who have run into problems with this too. So I want to mention this pattern that a lot of orchestrators offer, but I kind of want to steer you away from using this pattern. Some orchestrators can signal a process when the configuration changes, and a lot of times in these scenarios, the configuration is not stored in environment variables, but is stored in maybe a JSON document or an XML document. Then the orchestrator tells the service that the configuration file has changed, the service um, receives notification of that, and then it will open up the new config file while the service keeps running, and it will read in the new settings, and the service is able to reconfigure itself on the fly without having to gracefully shut down and come back up. And that's why this sounds like it's a great idea. Right? It sounds really nice to allow the service to go and reconfigure itself without having any downtime at all. However, in my experience of this and the experience of many customers has been that this doesn't work particularly well. The problem is that as the program is running, it's going to grab passwords and other information and it stores those in maybe static fields inside your program or even in a local variable inside a function and then it's going to use the password or the, the information, the configure information in doing something. And when one thread in your program receives notification that the configuration has changed, it reads the file and changes some values, but other parts of the program don't know that, doesn't know that that happened. 
And so now your program is running and pieces of the code are using the old values, pieces of the code are using the new values, and your program's really not in a consistent state. And that can really introduce some very hard to detect bugs and corruption because it's really all based on timing. And it, so it'll be very near impossible to reproduce this scenario. So my recommendation to you is to reconfigure your services by bringing the service instance down completely, then restarting it with the new config so that everything in that process is using the new configuration values. Um, I also mentioned this bottom bullet here that it's impossible to keep track of all of this. I already said that part. And it's also impossible to update the values atomically. So I'll give an example of something that happened. In a configuration XML file, someone had a username and password information. Uh, of course, the password was using that CMS syntax. Then a piece of their code was reading the password information, or the username information, and then a notification came, the new config came in. The new config had changed the username and password. But the other part of the program had already read the username config. Now it's trying to read the password config. So it has the old username and the new password, which are not atomically consistent, right? It's not a consistent set of values. And then it couldn't authenticate anymore against the database engine that it was trying to talk to. So again, because you can't update these things atomically, I strongly discourage the use of this pattern. Bring the service down gracefully, reconfigure, come back up. All right, now I said I would talk a little bit more about the cryptographic message syntax. Um, I want to talk about this because it's very common where people are, have secrets like passwords, certificate information, and they want to put that in configuration, which is great, that's the perfect place for it, but people don't want to put that information in there in clear text, and, and that's great. Unfortunately, a lot of people do put clear text secrets in today. They put it in their source code, and then they check it into source code repositories like GitHub. Um, those things can be broken into potentially, and then people can get access to those passwords. As, and if they're in clear text, you're in a world of hurt. So uh, the best way to protect your secrets is to use this technology called crypto cryptographic message syntax, or CMS. And this enables you to avoid putting clear text secrets in configuration files or in source code. And it will encrypt and decrypt messages using RFC 3852. So if you want to learn more about it, that's a great uh, document to look up where you can read more about how this works. And a lot of programming platforms support this, certainly .NET does, uh, where you can easily go and write very little code in order to take advantage of this feature. So the way that it works is the person who's producing the secret, right, the person who has the password, if you will, they go and use the CMS to encrypt that clear text secret, the password, for a recipient using a certificate. And you embed the certificate's thumbprint, well, doing this encryption will also embed the, the certificate's thumbprint in the ciphertext that gets produced. The ciphertext is the output of this operation. And the certificate thumbnail used to encrypt is embedded in that ciphertext. So now the ciphertext has the encrypted password, but it also has the thumbnail, thumbprint, sorry, of the certificate that was used to encrypt it. And that's one logical unit of piece of information. That piece of information can then be placed into a settings value, uh, like an environment variable, that will be read by the secret consumer, which would be your service instance code. So now the secret uh, consumer, your service instance code, when it initializes itself, it will go and read the ciphertext value out of the environment variable, and then it uses the CMS operations to decrypt that ciphertext. And it knows which certificate to use to decrypt it because the thumbprint was embedded in the ciphertext. Uh, of course, the certificate has to be available on the machine that's doing the encrypting, and it has to be available on the machine that's doing the decrypting. So a lot of people will place these certificates in the certificate store of the machine. Uh, in order to you know, make that possible. And then the uh, CMS will go and decrypt it, which automatically uses the certificate referenced by the embedded thumbprint. Um, and then it gives you back the clear text, which you can then use in your running code. And that's how we should encrypt secrets and embed them in configuration settings that are used by our service instances.